Welcome to the graveyard. This is your tour of cemetery art and history and symbolism with the Gravestone Girls. Shameless self-promotion, gravestonegirls.com, supporting the Gravestone Girls' mission to keep our dead alive by preserving cemetery art and history. Uh, we have a lot of fun with what we do. No one will ever accuse us of not enjoying our jobs. Um, this is a picture of the three gravestone girls in their natural habitat. It's really true. Um, there's an S on the end of that. There is more than one of me. Um, I am the boss. I am the one with the uh, most nerve and the big enough mouth to stand in front of a group of people and talk for more than an hour. The other two ladies, um, Melissa, our web mistress Zipporah, if you follow us on Facebook, you would know her by that name. And my best friend Maggie, uh, these ladies help keep me together, help keep Gravestone Girls going, and, and help keep us looking good both internally and externally. So I want to tell you just a little bit uh, about what the Gravestone Girls do and why, how we came to be, what, why we're here. Uh, we do public presentations like this. I want to educate you about what's in your town, what's on your main streets, your back roads, in the backyards, and not just of your town, but what you can find in, in other towns, almost anywhere else through the New England area when it comes to cemeteries and gravestones. We lead cemetery tours. We also do research. We do work for other people that live in farther parts of the country that trace their ancestry back this way, and they may ask us to go find a family plot, document it, clean it, uh, replicate it, and I'll get to that in a moment. We also teach gravestone rubbing classes, and I do want to speak just a minute about this. There's a lot of misconception. Gravestone rubbing is bad, it's dangerous, it's illegal, it shouldn't be done, and none of that is true. The key to doing gravestone rubbings is that it is a properly executed gravestone rubbing. That means you got to get a little bit of education before you go out. You should seek permission from whoever oversees the burial ground. You should know how to choose the right stone. You should use the right materials, and you should absolutely put a barrier between the gravestone and your working surface. So never at any time are you attaching anything to that original stone. And with that barrier, no matter what medium you're using to make the rubbing to get the image, uh, no matter what material, what medium you use for that, if something happens and you soak through the paper, or you break through for whatever reason, it's not going to get on the stone. Um, preservation is, is numero uno, job number one. Um, it is not illegal in Massachusetts to do gravestone rubbing. It is the most often asked question that I have to answer as a gravestone girl. There is no sweeping law in Massachusetts on the books that prohibits gravestone rubbing. There are some guidelines and recommendations from um, the DCR, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, and they would like to steer people away from it just to keep it from being done incorrectly. But there's nothing illegal about it. It is up to whoever oversees the burial ground to determine what they will and will not allow. I grew up in Central Mass in a little tiny cow town, and uh, my mother taught me to rub gravestones in the family cemetery as a method of keeping me occupied and out of her hair while she and my grandmother were taking care of the family plot. And years go by, I've got all these pieces of paper from doing gravestone rubbings all over the place. And it led to the last thing on this list that gravestone girls do. We make replicas. And I'm going to hand a few of them around because, you know, I brought some with me. So these are not souvenirs. There are not samples. I want them back at the end of my program. I know how many are out there. So take a peek, pass them around. Um, they're made directly from the faces of the original gravestones. So while, yes, they're available for sale tonight, that's not really why I brought them. That's just an added bonus. Um, I brought them to show you that other component that gravestone girls do in terms of historic preservation. Uh, we actually make an impression directly from the face of the original that allows us to get the art home and re replicate it from there. And this started as something that Maggie and I developed a long time ago. I have an art history and restoration education. So I took what I knew from the trade to develop a process I could safely take into the cemetery. 
to collect and then take it home and replicate. And we were doing it just to make a couple of our favorites that, that uh, we wanted to have because I figured it would be found if we removed them from the cemetery. So the joke became nothing says Merry Christmas or Happy Birthday like a gravestone. <laughs> so people started giving them as gifts. Um, <coughs> Melissa comes along, she builds the website, she makes us famous on the internet. And one day I get an email with this picture. And it's from a guy in Ohio. And he says, this is my seventh great grandfather. He was a colonel in the Revolutionary War. This stone is in Concord, Massachusetts. And I was just trolling the internet looking for a way to replicate it so that I could have this as part of my, my family's history, my family's genealogy and mementos. And I found you gravestone girls. And since you ladies are in Massachusetts, and since you know how to do this safely already, might I hire you to do this project for us? And I may have mentioned that I was a good capitalist, and I got right on that. And we got permission from Concord to do the work. And this, this is Maggie going out there. We went out on a beautiful summer day a long, long time ago and collected that image. So what she's doing is taking an impression directly from the face of the original. Um, I will teach you how to rub gravestones all day long. No problem. I will not teach you how to do this. Don't ask me. I don't need the competition. And truly, I am a professional. Don't try this at home. This is where my educational background lies. So let me give you a little perspective here. It's a pretty big stone. Uh, Maggie is about 5 foot 10. She's close to 6 feet with all that hair piled on her head. Look how tall that stone is. So know that when you're looking at an old colonial slate gravestone in the ground, what you see above ground, there's going to be another one-third to two-thirds more stone underground. So if we were to take that stone up out of the ground, it would be somewhere in the area of eight to ten feet long. That's a finished size. Remember that somebody had to go and quarry that stone. So that original piece of stone before it was finished into the grave marker you see on the landscape, that original stone would have been wider and longer. All done by hand, taken out of the ground by hand from a local quarry. There were plenty of quarries around to receive, uh, to retrieve material from. The general rule seems to be no more than 15 miles away from its carving location. Uh, not its final resting place, as it were, not its final installation place, but raw material coming from no more than 15 miles away. And I have a little trouble with that number. I would guess it's even closer. I know in Central Mass, because I know my geology out there, we've got a lot of slate pits very close by. You didn't have to travel far before you were able to come into local materials to quarry for things like slate roofs, foundation stones, gravestones, or other use of stone material. So West Bridgewater, established from Bridgewater in 1822, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 cemeteries in the historic register on town. Uh, I've put them up here in chronological order by founding date. The Alger Cemetery and Tomb uh, was moved. I forgot where. I was going to add it so I wouldn't forget, but it's in my, my reference book over here. But I came to town ahead of time to get ready for tonight's program. So I came here and I went to all of these cemeteries and I took pictures. And I used those pictures to build the program that you're going to see this evening. So I will show you how you can tell that too when we get there. Before we get started on your actual tour, your virtual tour, we have to answer two questions about the origin and the evolution of the cemetery. We need to answer the questions of why do we bury the dead and where do gravestones come from? The archaeological record 50,000 plus years ago indicates that many different groups of people, many different societies believed that there was something else after this world. We did something here, we lived our lives here, we passed on and we went somewhere else. And we know that because when we do excavations, we may find things in the grave along with the body. As humans, we have a definite 
start time and a different end time. Um, and when that body dies, you have to do something with it. So we dig a hole, we make a grave, we put the body in the grave, and we cover that grave early on, we covered it with multiple stones, not one, but multiples. And those multiple stones, which is where we get the word gravestone from, those multiple stones served a number of really good purposes. It shows you where you buried somebody so that you could go back if you wanted to visit or remember. You wanted to mark where that spot is so when it comes time to bury someone else, you don't disturb the folks that are already there. And it also very early on served a practical purpose of covering that freshly turned earth so that it couldn't be disturbed by wild animals. So in that grave, you might often find grave goods, things like this. This is very simple, but we also find them to be very elaborate, right? Aren't these big pointy things really just big old gravestones? They contain things that Pharaoh needs, wonderful things that Pharaoh needs for the next world. So it can be very simple, like these bowls, which may have held oils or food, uh, other things that might be needed, or they might, might be very elaborate in its construction and content. But it marks the spot where we've put someone, and it shows that we had a belief system that says there is something more that comes after this, because we need these objects to take with us to the next world. Now, while I can talk about 50,000 years worth of history, we don't have that kind of time, so I'm going to get to the good stuff. I'm going to cover the evolution of gravestones and burial grounds slash cemeteries, because they are two different things. I'm going to cover the time periods from the, the first period, which is the colonial, which goes from the first settlement in the 1600s through the 1700s. We will take a walk through the rural garden movement, the second phase that comes in in the 19th century. And we're also going to take a peek inside the modern cemeteries of the 20th and the 21st century. So I'll tell you now, and I will remind you when we get there, I came to town and I took pictures in your cemeteries. That means I took pictures in all your cemeteries, including your new ones. So when we get to the modern section, you may see some folks that you know come up on the screen, the gravestones of some people you may know. Don't freak out. It can be very shocking to see somebody you know up here in a public presentation. Uh, so I've tried to protect the identities, but you know, if you know the stone, then, then you know the stone. I'm not using those modern stones to say this is a very good example, or this is a bad example, or this is, this is better than another. Um, I'm not trying to pick out an individual for any particular reason. I am using the gravestones that I find in the modern landscapes to illustrate what we as a society, what we as people think about ourselves and memorialization and our mortality in a modern sense, the same way I use pictures of the colonial and 19th century gravestones to illustrate what society was thinking about memorial practices and their own mortality back in those time periods as well. So when you see slides come up, they're going to have captions on them. Uh, the top line will tell you what we're looking at. Here we're looking at a colonial landscape. And then underneath it will say the name of the location where I found it. So if it says the name of the graveyard, you know it's here in West Bridgewater. If it's from someplace outside of West Bridgewater, it will say Hartford, Connecticut, or Mars, or wherever I happen to have traveled to get that particular photo. So this is a very typical colonial period landscape in a burial ground. Burial ground, graveyard, um, they're not cemeteries yet. They're not churchyards either. Uh, they're, bare, they're usually established close by the original meeting houses. The meeting house was used for religious services, but it was also used for other social events, civic events, uh, other planning. It had multiple uses to it. So we're not, we're not building churches early on yet. So when you see this colonial space, know that what you're looking at has absolutely changed over time. And that may sound strange to us because we, with our current thoughts about historic preservation, we don't want anything to be changed. We want it to be in its original position, its original condition. 
we want to try and put it back that way if it has been changed over time. But know that when you see this space is absolutely changed over time, and it'll change for any number of reasons. Uh, it changes because if they're typically located in the middle of town, as town grows and changes, as we put in roads, as we widen roads, as we develop property to build buildings, this space is some, one of the first to give up land. Once they understand the concepts of sanitation, they might not want all of these dead people hanging around downtown, so they may move them. Uh, they may bury them under. I live in Worcester. My colonial burial ground was put under in the mid-1800s to make way for the trolley cars. That's called progress. It's called progress at the time. So modern, uh, landscaping plays a role on how this land gets uh, redeveloped or changed around. And even just general aesthetic desires of a particular time period will cause people to come in here and go, oh, we got to tidy this place up. And they'll straighten it up. All of those things are, leave an absolute clue on the landscape for you to, to easily spot once you know to look for it. See all these nice, neat rows? These guys have been moved for certain. They've been tidied up. Gravestones had parts, just like anything else. We've got a shoulder here. This lunette where the art is contained is called the tympanum. And then we've got another shoulder here. Underneath the art in the tablet here is your, typically your general bio biographical information. So it's going to be who it is, names, dates, ages, if we're lucky, cause of death. Uh, it could be very simple, and, and early on it is pretty simple. This idea of a colonial gravestone, what we typically identify as a colonial gravestone, starts showing up on the landscape the last quarter of the 1600s. Prior to that, if we were using anything for gravestones, if we were putting them out there at all, they would be very simple. They might have been wooden markers, which over time would have decayed and now be lost to us. They also may have been just the rough stones that, that you're familiar with seeing and the, the st beautiful stone walls that are on the landscapes of New England. Maybe they've got something written on them. Maybe they don't. Uh, oftentimes with those early stones, it's very easy to walk right by them and not even know that you're looking at a gravestone. But this guy that we're used to seeing as a colonial, as a typical colonial gravestone, uh, starts showing up, like I said, the last quarter of the 1600s or so. Underneath this biographical information, a little later on, we get a third part that gets put in down underneath that's called an epitaph. Two lines, four lines, maybe a little longer, maybe a little shorter, but it's going to be something that would be easily recognizable and understandable by the reader. So it might be part of a hymn, it might be a biblical passage, it might be something from contemporary, contemporary literature of the time. It's very unlikely that it's going to be, I wrote my husband's epitaph. That's not how it works. It is not about the, the personal or the sentimental reasons or the sentiment of the message itself. It's about a bigger message about mortality and morality that would be very easily understood by the reader. And that's what all of the objects that we find on these colonial gravestones are for. They're mortality and morality messages. Gravestones also came in two parts originally, headstones and footstones. So if you bury father and he's six feet tall, there's a six foot spread between his headstone and footstone. You bury mother next to him and she's five feet tall, there's a five foot spread between her headstone and footstone. So take that logic and apply it to this photo up here and tell me that everybody was all the same height. Doesn't seem to make any sense, does it? They were a certain race of people that were all the same size. No. This is another visual cue for you that this space has been reorganized. Isn't this about the right size for the lawnmowers to go through? You want to be that guy pushing the lawnmower around all those stones? All those, between all those headstones and footstones at all those different locations? No. So if we're lucky, they get pushed out into their own row, um, and if we're lucky, as in this example down here, this is 
this is, I'm upside down. This is the graveyard, old graveyard? No, this is Jerusalem. This is your old graveyard. And see, that's my car. I really did come and take these pictures. So if we're lucky, they get pushed out, they get made into their own row. Um, if we're lucky, they get tucked up like this. So they're with their parent stone. If we're not so lucky, out they go. We're good Yankees. We repurpose. They end up in walkways and patios and stone walls and foundations and feel, uh, window sills and in all kinds of crazy places. Um, or they just get discarded. They get tossed off into the woods and get lost. When they get moved out and made to their own little row, I often get people that say, oh, look at those tiny stones. Those must be for children. You know, they're their own row. It's not how, that's not how that works. Um, there's a way to tell. And it's another clue that the burial ground's been reorganized. So if this is my headstone and it says my name, Brenda P. Sullivan, well then the stone that's out here behind me, like in these cases here, uh, the stone that's out behind that big one, if it's in the right place, it will say my initials or it will say my name again. There will be something that ties the big stone and the little stone together. If this stone says my name and the footstone out behind it, or even if, if it's a footstone that's tucked up behind it, says something different, it says MDY, has MDY initials on it, then you know that it's not in the right place. So it's another cue that these spaces have been changed around. Look at all those handsome faces. I get asked a lot, skulls on gravestones, winged skulls on gravestones. What was wrong with those people? Why were they doing this? Who would do this? Uh, the who's that would do this were the people of the time. Put yourself in their shoes. Life is really hard. You're spending every moment just trying to survive. They were faced with death at every moment. They knew that it was inevitable, it was inescapable, and it could strike you or you or you or you at any moment. And it was the idea of being prepared for that moment. The idea that they were very religious, they were very superstitious, and at this point, last quarter of the 1600s through the early 1700s, they are following the Bible to the letter. They're very strict in their interpretation. So they understood, they held a belief system that said, you've got one immortal soul and your job is to keep it free of sin so that when the flesh fails and the body, and the body is buried, the soul is released so that it can make its flight to the next world at a particular point in time. It's your job to keep that soul clean. So you're supposed to do your best work while you're here. So when you read stones that say, this person was kind, compassionate, helpful, useful, generous. It isn't to say, look how great I was. It was to say, I tried to embody these virtues. And while you stand here and look at my stone, think on your own mortality, because you're going to end up in a hole in the ground and your soul is going to go off somewhere and be judged. And you need to try to aspire the way I tried to aspire every day. Uh, they lived in a, in a period where they believed even the slightest transgression might be the difference between going to heaven or heading downstairs. So a small thing could count against you. So you had to be vigilant about this behavior. And they used the skull to show the idea of mortality because at the time, to use something that looked human or looked like, a, like an angel would have been considered a graven image and would have been blasphemous. That's how literal they are. There are other messages on the stones. And up here, under some of this is all biological growth. I say I find a lot of it on your stones down here. It has, it's got a, a I don't know exactly, but there's a number of influences that I think uh, your proximity to your, to the ocean, your air currents, uh, it's carrying a lot of that stuff on the wind and implanting itself on your stones. And it makes a lot of them down here difficult to read. Uh, in the Bridgewater areas, out in the Middleborough areas, all the way down. Uh, yeah, we're not going to talk about cleaning tonight, but it can be, know that it can be clean. 
but it will obscure the faces sometimes and you have to uh, you have to know what you're looking for you have to take some time to stop and look at it so what this message underneath all this growth says it's Latin it says memento mori and it means remember your mortality think on death remember you're immortal remember you're not going to be mortal forever well, that's lovely that that stone has Latin on it, and so does this one, this fabulous stone in Hartford, Connecticut. And it's got a Latin phrase on it that says, Figus ti grave finitur. Well, that's fabulous, but I don't need to know how to read Latin in the 17th and 18th century to understand this message. This picture says it all, because that's what this is. That's what all of this is. It's a picture language. So. We know it spoke to the population about mortality and morality. It did it to the people that could read and write, so that they could read the Latin, or could read the messages that were written on the stones. But they didn't always take the time to stop and read. So we've got to get them, we've got to get their attention and keep them reminded. It's, it's a behavioral correction system with those pictures. But we also need to get the people that can't read and write. We've got to be very obvious in the messages about souls and mortality. So this is a tree. You're the tree. The tree is symbolic of something that's living like a human life. It has a definite beginning. It has a definite end. And that life is fragile and can be interrupted at any time. And that's exactly what's going on here. You're the tree. Today is your day. Because this is your maker. He's come out of the clouds with his hatchet, and he felled your tree. Well, we hope that you were ready. You were supposed to be ready at every moment by being vigilant of your behavior and monitoring your virtues and your deeds, because this is it. That's the end. You can't do any more. It's been his decision. You couldn't stop it. You just needed to be prepared for it. So that Latin phrase says, I am done. Well, yeah, if you're the tree, you're done. But a great fear comes to an end. They were living under this constant pressure with these messages on the stones, with the messages that they listened to every Sunday in religious services, with the way they read or had the Bible read to them in the evenings, always, always, on and on about behavior and mortality and eternal damnation and be ready and be prepared. Well, I don't have to worry about that anymore. It's over. It's definitely over. And I've done what I can, so I hope that it's enough. Lightly inscribed across the top of this stone reads, The grave is God's hiding place. Not to worry. Death is not a permanent condition. The grave is someplace you stay for a while. It's like God's waiting room. Because we're waiting for something very important. We're waiting for this. We're waiting for Gabriel to come from the east, blowing his trumpet and signaling the call to resurrection. The idea of being resurrected, redeemed of your sins, and ascending to heaven. So remember when we saw those headstones and footstones? The body is buried in between the headstone and the footstone. And that body was buried in a very specific manner. The, it was buried behind the headstone. So the writing faced out. The body was in the back. And it was there for a very good reason. Because on this day, on Judgment Day, the Archangel Gabriel comes from the east, blowing his trumpet, and all the dead sit up facing east to meet their maker. It was an important call. You didn't want to miss that call. You were supposed to be ready at every moment for it because that call could come at any time. And if you missed it, you got left behind and you didn't get your earthly reward by getting into heaven. This fella, this handsome devil, is death. He is man and his mortality as well, symbolized by the skull. And it says here, all must submit to the king of terrors. Death was known as the king of all terrors, and all must submit, right? Nobody gets out of here alive. We're all going. But don't worry. Don't worry about the fear that you've got, because if you've done the right job, followed what you're supposed to do, 
read on where it says through Christ we conquer, rise, and reign forever. The promise that there's something more after this. Look at those happy faces. Beautiful faces. As we come into the 1720s, there's a great awakening that happens. It starts in England. It makes its way over here. We're still a British colony. And the idea is we've been here about 100 years. We've got a number of natural-born generations. Those nat natural-born generations, those newer, younger people, they are the modern people of the time. And they say, yeah, you know, we're still very religious and we're still superstitious, but they're not following the Bible so strictly, not to the letter, not so literally. They are using it as a guide. They're still very serious about it, but it's a guide that you will do your best while you're here. And that's not different. The part that's different is there's more of a, a relationship or more of an understanding with the maker rather than just being a plebe at, at completely at the maker's mercy. The maker know, will know that you've done when you've done your best and you will be rewarded accordingly for that. So now not every little bad thought or not every little offhanded remark might be the difference between going upstairs and going downstairs. The idea is do the best work you can and you'll be judged fairly. But you still have that soul to consider. So you still have to keep it clean. You still have to do the best work to see that it gets off to the next world. But we take that winged skull, that death's head, and that skull is allowed to grow some skin and take on a, a human or an angelic look without being considered a graven image. It's the modern symbol for the time. And know that when you see faces on the stones, they are not the individual in the grave. Carvers carved in particular styles, some evolved over time, some carved in the same style all the way through their career. It is meant to be the idea of being human. It is not a representation of each individual in that particular grave. There are other symbols on these old stones and I wanted to make sure you knew about them. Um, again, there's some biological on the fronts of these so they're a little difficult to see, but get used to it. You know, you get used to using your eyes and taking the time to look and let the, let the images come out at you, let the words come out at you too because sometimes those are hard to read as well. This, so I see a lot, what you're looking at here is you've got these, these sort of leaves unfurling and they're kind of opening up. So I've got a number of, no, nobody in the, in the gravestone study community agrees on everything, as they don't agree everywhere else either. So symbols are prone to interpretation. So this is one of them that seems to be difficult for people to actually agree upon. It's one that I see down in this area a lot. So these might be um, leaves unfurling, these might be clouds, they might be just an abstract design that the carver chose to do and do over and over and over with variants in this region. And I chose this one because while these images here, these leafy things, I see all the time around here, but it's got this really beautiful border around it that um, is a nice variation. Can you see that? That's a heart. That whole tympanum is nothing but that heart. Um, the heart was considered the seat of the soul. We see hearts on stones, but rarely do I see them uh, that large and that nicely, that nicely done. It's a, it's a primitive, it's got a primitive look to it, but it's, it's a rather unusual, uh, prominent feature in the tympanum of that stone. Here's something that we should be familiar with. Where do we use crossbones? Do we have a pirate here? No. No, but pirates use skulls and crossbones. Um, we use it on our poison containers. We use it to, at high voltage uh, or things that are very dangerous, very much to use as a warning. 
And so we've got this sole symbol here with the bones over it. They happen to be the long bones of the legs, should you need to know which bones we've chosen for that. Oh, yeah, I'm full of all this kind of stuff. Uh, and it's just, here's your soul. Oh, wait, mortality. Don't forget, you're going to die. Don't forget. On and on and on. We're going to put as many variants on there as we can to keep that message out in front of people. Something else that I find down here a lot um, along this southeastern mass area, these beautiful suns, and a lot of them. These are all from the old burial ground, and you've got a, a good number of these um, in town, but particularly in the old burial ground. And when I find them, they're always so, usually so covered with biological growth that they're very, very hard to photograph. But I got a really good one there. Look at him. He's at the horizon. So it's the sun setting on this life, but the promise that it's going to rise on the next life. When you see gravestones that say, as in this case, that this person aged 71 years, 2 months, and 28 days. I'm judged on every day that I'm here. I'm judged for the work that I've done. So if I get up every day and I make a good faith effort and I try to do my best, I want credit for every day that I'm here. I got up for the 28th days and I didn't get up on the 29th day, but I want my credit for the 29 days that I did make my best attempts. As we get to the close of the 1700s, there's big changes. So there's a guy across the pond that we go, hey, thanks, Mr. King. It's been great, but you know, we're going to take care of ourselves now. We're going, to, we're going to govern ourselves, and we're going to start this new nation. So there's a revolution. And after the revolution, the founding fathers are looking for ideologies to base this new nation on, to really set us up and say who we are and why we did what we did to become independent. So they look at the highly successful ancient civilizations of the Greeks and the Romans, who were the founders of the concepts of democracy and the republic, the ability of the people to govern themselves, and they adopt that ideology. At the same time, real-time archaeology is taking place in places like Pompeii and Herculaneum in Italy. Uh, Greece is being excavated. The far reaches of the Roman outposts across Europe are being dug up and brought to light. And that sparks neoclassicism, a classical revival that's termed neoclassicism, where that art and architecture from those civilizations physically filter in to the land of the living here. So it influences our architecture, it influences our furniture, it influences our dress, and it very specifically can influence the land of the dead as well. With this, this come, that's been coming up out of the ground during these excavations is very specific. It's a cinerary urn. So it's the vessel that carries the body, both literally and figuratively. So the idea with the use of these cinerary urns in places like Greece and ancient Rome is that when the body, when someone died, the body was put out in a tomb, it would decay, and the rest of what was left after a certain period of time was then put into these urns. Um, there was also cremation. So we sped the process up a bit, and we put what was left in the urns. So the urn starts showing up as a modern symbol of the time, coming into the early 1800s, coming out of the late 17s, and it becomes a modern symbol. When we add something to that, we use another one, and this is such a really great find. I saw a bunch of them around here. Um, you know what? I've practiced this word a hundred times. Chocheset? Oh, yeah, I knew I wasn't going to get that right. <laughs> and you just said it, you all just said it, and I'm still not going to get it right. So that cemetery just down here at 106, um, look at this lovely creature. It's a willow, and it's a... It's a very nice variant of a willow tree. We've chosen the willow tree to start showing up on gravestones in this time period because willows are, by virtue of their name and by the way they look, they're a perfect symbol for mourning, as well as just like the tree we saw before. 
Trees are like people. Definite beginning, definite end, and can be, that life can be interrupted at any time because it's very fragile. So we'll see these symbols separately across stones through the 1800s, and they come together very often and become the, the very common symbol throughout the 1800s of the urn and the willow, something uh, living, something dead, the idea of a beginning and an end. Here's a variant of that you'll see a lot of. So here is your urn and willow. Everything up here, all of this, terra firma. Everything's above ground. The rest of this is metaphor. So see, look at these lovely neoclassical posts. I love that they're halves. They're not full posts there. The idea of you're coming through that gate. This is called a gateway. So you're coming through the gate here. And it's the entrance to the burial ground. Because these aren't cemeteries yet. It's the entrance to the burial ground. It's also the entrance to the tomb. And it's also the portal to the next world. This looks really different, doesn't it? This looks nothing like that colonial burial ground that we've been looking at all this time. Anybody been here? Good job. Good job. Those you haven't, we'll go tomorrow. I'm not doing anything during the day. <laughs> Pack me a lunch. This is Mount Auburn Cemetery. This is the first time a place where we go and bury our dead gets called a cemetery. Cemetery comes from a Greek word that means sleeping place or dormitory. It reflects the idea, the change in attitude, the change in ideas about dying. In the colonial period, you moldered in the grave and you got eaten by worms and you were dust and dirt. Here, not so much. This is a nice place to go, right? You want to spend it, not a bad place to spend eternity. Green grass, rolling hills, pathways to walk, trees. Monuments are different shapes and sizes. They're even different colors. They're a different material. This very much reflects who the modern people of the time were. So we are moving from being a, an agrarian society. We're leaving the farms. We're coming and we're working in the, in the factories, in, the, in becoming an industrialized nation. And we look back at our colonial ancestors and their dark stones and their hatchets and their skulls and their crossbones, and we say, what a bunch of barbarians. We're not those people. We're very enlightened. We're very modern. That's not how we think about ourselves as, as people, as society. That's not how we think about what happens to us when we move from this world to the next. So we're going to change everything about that burial ground and we're going to make it a cemetery. And Mount Auburn is the first cemetery. It's called a rural, well, rural garden cemetery. It was established in 1831 by the Massachusetts Horticultural Society in Cambridge. Not only was it meant for a place to bury the dead, it was also meant to be an arboretum. It was a place that really reflected what society was thinking at the time. So there's a bunch of things going on. So we're moving to being an industrialized nation. There are writers like Hawthorne and Thoreau and Longfellow are writing about nature, about communing with nature, about preserving nature, about getting back to nature. There is a rise of a religion, spiritualism, and they are, they are having their seances and they're using their Ouija boards, uh, and utopian societies and these perfect societies about communing here and with the dead. So for the folks of the 19th century, it was far worse to die it was inconvenient, but it was far worse to be forgotten than to die. Sure, we all knew we had to go, but we want to stay part of the family, and we want the family that lost us to remember us, so they'll keep us with them. The, word, the veil between this world and the next is really very thin. It's not hard to get there. It's not far to go. It's as simple as walking from one room to the next. All of that societal thought gets wrapped up here in this green space. And when Mount Auburn Cemetery opens in 1831, it becomes a tourist attraction. 
same as it is today. People start flocking to this place because it is open green space. It is originally 75, now about 175 acres of oasis. Four miles outside of dirty, filthy, downtown, industrialized Boston. So they come here not just because they've got dead people. They come here to see this newfangled space and they come to get back to the things that we've left behind by changing from an agrarian to industrial. When Mount Auburn opened and created such a stir, the landscape architect Frederick Olmsted used Mount Auburn as an inspiration for the idea of a public park. And he used it as inspiration for Central Park in New York. And everybody starts doing this cemetery thing. So surrounding towns across, across Massachusetts and outside, uh, everybody starts doing this newfangled cemetery thing. So here is Pleasant Hill. You've also got Pine Hill here in town. Um, it is, and you can tell by the name, right? Which period it is. The old burial ground. Pine Hill. <laughs> Swan Point. Mountain View. You know, it's much more, uh, much more euphoric. There's that high uh, Victorian sentimentality, a lot of romanticism. So everybody starts making these cemeteries. And one of the things that starts happening is we get this. We get, for the first time, we get the ability to purchase a family plot. Sort of a home away from home. Vacation home, if you will. The idea that one family member at a time, they go, they, get, they die, they get put in this space, and eventually the family is all brought back together. So we've got this family plot. We're going to do something to, to show that this is our property. We're going to put our foundation down. So we could do something very simple like this. This is called curbing or coping. It marks where this new homestead is. They can be very simple. I've seen them very elaborate with big walls and staircases. and It's just all about the money. But it's the idea that the family is all brought back together in one location. And with the founding of this concept of the cemetery and the idea of being able to get a family plot, it wasn't unusual for family members to take ancestors out of other graveyards and sort of move them on up to the east side and put them together, bring, bring the family back together in this family plot. <coughs> When you have these family plots, I buy one, my neighbors buy one, because we live close to each other in life, we would want to be close to each other as we pass on. Because these are very social spaces. You don't just put the dead there and go away. You put the dead there and you come back and you visit. And you, pick, you pack your picnic lunches and you sit around and you visit with the deceased and your neighbors are over in their plot and you're looking at each other's new monuments and you're gossiping and you're talking about the news and the weather and you're communing with nature. This, is a, this cemetery becomes a very social place for activity. Much softer symbols. No hatchets, no axes, no crossbones, no moldering in the grave. Our visual symbols are much softer. So angels come and carry you from your bed gently take you to the next world. Uh, things I found around Pleasant Hill, uh, the dove, the idea of peace. Doves are also white, symbolic of purity and heaven. A sheath of wheat, the harvest, the end of, of the, the cycle, the end of the, the life, the harvest, reaping of the rewards. Can you figure this guy out? Here's his head. He's kneeling down on his haunches. Yep, we've got a lamb here. Faith and hope. That anchor is a symbol of hope. So this is a good time to talk about two things. These three pictures, these are all stone. They're, they're marble. 
So one of the things that changes when we move to the cemetery, like you saw the picture of Mount Auburn and now here, we moved from using local materials like slate to using different materials that were available. <coughs> and they're available from farther distances because now we have waterways and railroads to move things like marble from Vermont or from other parts of the country and bring them in and use them here for monuments on the landscape. And marble was chosen not only because it was easily accessible and a modern stone of the time, a modern, uh, newly available in that modern time period, it was white and bright, so it was symbolic all by itself. It looked beautiful on the landscape, bright white, symbolic of purity, symbolic of heaven. The one little problem with choosing to move from slate to marble is that they're completely different geologically. So marble is sediment that builds up in layers. The layers are compressed together through the forces of the earth that makes a very durable stone, very weather resistant, stone that's still easily workable so that you could still chisel it by hand to get your art and your lettering <laughs> on it. But it's very durable when it comes to weathering, which is why you can see a slate stone that might be dated 1702 and still look really good and be very legible. Whereas marble is a different kind of geological material. It's got a lot of calcium carbonate in it, so it's the same material as your bones and your teeth. It's got a very loose grain to it. So it's more like salt in a shaker. Lots of individual grains. And they're not tightly packed. So marble is very susceptible to the effects of weather and erosion. So rain and wind eroding off, which makes them different, difficult to figure out what you're looking at a lot of times. As well as it's very porous. So marble will absorb pollutants and become discolored like this. They can be cleaned. Um, once it's eroded, you're not getting it back, but you can do something to get rid of the biological and you can do something to clean up a lot of this black, which may be pollutants, it might be uh, biological, it might be soluble salts. It is treatable. That's a whole nother lecture, a whole nother workshop. <laughs> the idea here is when you see them on the landscape, use, use those eyes, use your 19th century eyes to picture what these looked like when all of these objects on the landscape were bright white and brand new. Keep these guys in mind, not the images themselves, but this material, because we're going to visit that a little bit later. If you're looking for me, up is where we're open to go. This is exactly the same thing as that wing skull. It's just the modern symbol for the time. This is a 19th century symbol. It is the idea of something else beyond this, the promise that we're going to meet again, shaking hands, goodbye in this life, hello in the next life, and it's written right on the stones. We shall meet again. This isn't it. Don't worry, there's more to come and we'll all be brought back together. There's a whole language of flowers in the 19th century and we put them on the stones for particular interpretations. So remember all the stuff I said about trees? Flowers are the same thing. Flowers are like human lives. They are, they've got a period where they, they bud, they grow, they bloom, and the bloom fades and the life passes. So when you see flowers, on gravestones like that, they're very often particular flowers. They can be anything. They can be roses. They can be morning glories. There was a whole language of flowers that every flower had a meaning. Again, whole nother lecture. Uh, but the idea of the full bloom, the bloom, the life fully realized, and the bloom that's faded upon death, often you will see, and again, because of the the dirt and, and erosion, this is hard to see, but there's a little bud right there, and there's a stem, there's some leaves. The idea, the life in that bud, the life that begins, but the flower that never blooms, the bud that never gets to open, the life that never gets to be fully recognized or realized, 
uh, very often used for young children. Uh, childhood mortality very high right through the end of the 1800s. And uh, it's referencing the idea of nipped in the bud. There are some other things on the landscape that I found in town that I see other places as well that I want you to be aware of. Uh, they're, they're grave markers for sure, they're monuments, uh, but they're different from the tablet types of stones that we've been looking at along the way. These are over in the old graveyard. There's two things happening in this shot. There's this. This is called a hill tomb. And that's called a box tomb. As you can tell, there's very complicated vocabulary attached to being a gravestone girl. Hill tombs built into a hill. Box tombs shaped like a box. So there's a couple of things going on. Let's hit the box tombs first. So when you see these, and you might also see table stones. It looks like a table, a slab on the top on legs. And that harkens back to a European, early European traditions of being buried inside the church. You're buried in the crypt. The crypt is under the pulpit, uh, under the, what's that thing I'm talking about? <coughs> Altar. Yes, that's it. There's your pop quiz for the day. The idea that the people that were buried in the crypt were members of the clergy. They were important members of the community. All the rest of you riffraff outside. So typically when we see box tombs like this or the table ones, very often they are for the ministers of town. They are for founding fathers or important members of the town. And again, it's not to say, look how great I was. It's to say, it's a visual cue and all the writing on it is to say, I, I tried to be a leader. I tried to be a good person. I tried to be a productive member of society. And if you're the minister of a town, who else, is, who else is better qualified to get you to the next world than the minister? He is the, the conduit between this world and next and help put you on the path to get there. When we see these also um, for founding fathers, like I said, or important members of the community, I don't, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't say on it, well, it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily say, I was an excellent member of the community and look at all the things I did. But it might, it might say that they founded this or they built that or that they were charitable. Or, and it tends to be pretty lengthy. Uh, keep your eyes on those names because as you drive around town, you'll often find that family name repeated on places like your library, the town hall, streets. It's a nod to the individuals that help build communities. Don't let anybody tell you there's a box in there, a body inside that box. There is not. The body is in the ground. This is a hill tomb, because again, difficult vocabulary. It's a tomb built into a hill. And in this case, this is what's left. So this has actually been closed up, but you can see what's going on here. This is the facade. It had some stone uh, walls or, or buttresses up outside holding up this or, or two, it serves two purposes. It's architectural because it's going to look nice as well as um, behind here under this sod, this is all, all sod, and under the sod is going to be a brick structure. It's a vault. It's a room just like this. This has all been pushed up, but there was a door. You take all of this stuff out, there was a door here. And you walk through that door, you go down a couple of stairs, and it opens up into this chamber that we see here. You walked in with the caskets. You might put them on the ground. You might stack them on each other. There might be brackets on the wall that you put the caskets on to get them off the ground. Um, but they went inside that chamber. They did not go in the chamber and then get buried in the ground. They just went in the chamber, like putting them in any other type of room. These get closed up. I see a lot of them closed up. And actually, in, this old, in the old graveyard, this is not the only hill tomb here. There's a good number of them. Um, this is, 
as you can see, here's the stone wall. So this one's over here on the left, but as you get to the middle, there's a big hump in the middle of the landscape. And you can see a number of stones that were part of the facades, and actually one of them is gone, and you can see down into the chamber. They've been closed up. Sometimes they get closed up with remains inside, and the one I could look into didn't have anything in it. Sometimes they get closed up with remains inside. Sometimes the remains are taken out and, and moved elsewhere, put in a family plot somewhere. But they were, they're often closed up because if they're not maintained, they can be dangerous, you know, they can be unstable, as well as they just want to keep people out of there. I will tell you that when you find one, see if you can see in and see what you see. You may, you need to be careful not, because you're absolutely going to end up sticking your face in some cobwebs or bugs or, um, if you find them and they're open, it's a nice cool place on a hundred degree day in July. They serve very much the same purpose as a root cellar, um, in terms of, of temperature. There are two things on the landscape often, um, it can either be a hill tomb like this, it might be also be the receiving vault or the keep where you put the body when somebody died and maybe their tomb wasn't ready. Maybe you had to wait for family to come, to, to, to the rest of the family to come if there were going to be any kind of burial services. Uh, or if they died in the winter and the ground was frozen, it was too cold, too frozen to actually dig a grave. People would let other people use the family vaults and later on we get a permanent vault called a receiving vault on the landscape. And some people's vacation homes are just nicer than others. That's all there is to that. So this is called a mausoleum. Not a bad place to spend eternity, right? Beautiful architecture, manicured lawn, cul-de-sac, neighbors are quiet. <laughs> Very much that neoclassical architecture. This is a freestanding dwelling. The bodies are inside the building. They're not here in the ground. This was absolutely your home away from home. The family members held keys to those beautiful bronze doors and they walked up the pathway, up the stairs. They put the keys in the lock, they opened the door and they went inside. The bodies here, the the caskets are on the sides here in niches. They look like this. They look like, like lateral files, if you will. Uh, they're horizontal. So the, the casket went into the niche, and then the niche was covered with a board, typically some wood, and then a piece of finished stone so that it all looked very lovely and was all decorated nicely inside. So in this structure, in this mausoleum, the burials, the entombments are here on each side. So you come in the door and the, the stacks are on the side. And there's, in this case, there's three on each side. So this one sleeps six. You remember that idea of falling asleep, passing away. So you went in here and you would do things like sweep. You might put some flowers, you might put pictures, there may be a table, you sit and you have your, you have your lunch, you do that memento mori thing where you think about the people that are in there that went before you, you think about your own mortality and the idea of being brought back together, and you do what good Victorians do is they gossip about everybody. They were never, the people that were gone, they were never very far away. And if you have a home away from home, if you have a second home, don't you need furniture? <laughs> Anybody been here? Yeah. yeah. Road trip. So after we go to Mount Auburn, we'll just hop over to Vermont and we'll go here. Uh, this is Hope Cemetery. It's in Barrie, Vermont. It's a mile or so down the road from the Rock of Ages quarry. That quarry has been in business for more than 100 years. It produces this really beautiful blue-gray granite, and the majority of the markers and monuments in Hope Cemetery are made from that, from that granite. So it's very, it's a, it's a lovely 
space. It's very ethereal. It's very shimmery. And it's got a lot of really cool objects on the landscape. These two things are by no means anomalies on the landscape. In addition to things like this, we've got a race car, we've got an airplane, a sailboat, soccer ball, cat, big cat, um, a colonnade, statuary. We've got a really great deathbed scene, and you're just going to have to take my word for it. It's a really great deathbed scene. You can't miss it. The guy's like this in the chair. Uh, it's the stone carvers that were working at the Rock of Ages quarries were typically European and Irish. They were very talented and they were very competitive, which is why you get so much variety on this landscape. And I guess the moral of the story here is if you're going to spend eternity in bed, you will do so properly with two beds. You will hold hands, you love birds, and you will wear your pajamas. <laughs> An empty chair? Come sit, visit with me. I've only just stepped away. I haven't gone far. I've just moved to the other room for a minute. I'll be back. Never gone far. I've spent all this time saying, when you see this, this is what this means, and read it this way and interpret it that way, and it's all true. I would not waste your time. I'm not going to lie to you. But there is always going to be something about monuments that we don't know. So monuments are made by people for people. Some people make their own monuments. They want to have the last word. So they do it their way before they check out. So there's always going to be a personal element to that that we don't know. So in addition to all that big existential stuff, you also have to remember to consider the possibility that perhaps this is just their favorite chair. This landscape looks really different, doesn't it? So this looks completely different from the colonials. This looks completely different from the rural garden movement that we've seen. This is a modern 20th, 21st century cemetery. And there's a lot of reasons why this looks different. There is, as we come to the end of the 1800s, we've got Queen Victoria. She dies in 1901. She has been the, the ruling influence in England and really setting styles and trends around the world for 50 years. When she lost her husband, Albert, she went into a deep period of mourning. It establishes really the Victorian era and it's all of the things I've talked about. It's very emotional. It's highly sentimental. It's high romanticism. There's a lot of frenetic energy. You know, busy, busy. Lots of detail and lots of things going on. So everybody after that kind of goes, all right, stop. Oh, okay. And it's just part of the evolution. There's a, an arts and crafts movement that starts in England. It makes its way over here. We want to simplify. So the, in the land of the living, they do. That arts and crafts movement changes the architecture of the buildings. It changes the style of the furniture. People are changing the way they look. Women are losing those corsets and the bustles and those big dresses. They're cutting their hair. Men are shaving those ginormous beards that they've been cultivating for 20 years. It's a trend that I hope re-catches on right now. It's my own personal opinion. So everything changes again in the land of the living, so we change what happens here in the land of the dead. We want that, that space, that, that busy, busy Victorian, beautiful disaster that is a Victorian cemetery to go easy on the eyes again. We want to return it to a more pastoral look. We want to be able to really see the landscape. We want everything to fit together rather than jumping out and being in our faces all the time. Modern landscaping accounts for changes in the way things are laid out. The monument material changes because now we have, we have access 
regular access to power tools, water powered or steam powered pneumatic tools that are going to take granite out of the ground. Granite is one of the hardest substances on earth. It comes from the molten core of the earth and creates a very strong, durable stone. So we use it in our buildings and now we use it in the cemetery as well. And as we get into the 1900s, medicine moves from being art to being science. We start to understand how we get sick. We understand what bacteria is. We understand what germs are. We understand about washing our hands, covering our mouths when we sneeze, storing our food so that it doesn't spoil and make us sick. We get antibiotics. You get a cut. Is it going to kill you? No. You put an antibiotic on it, you put a Band-Aid on it, you're fine. Well, prior to that, it could be fatal. You get blood poisoning, you could get gangrene, you could lose your finger, you could lose your arm, you could lose your life. <laughs> so, as medicine ramps up, and think about what medicine has done, just, in, just call it the last 50 years, since the 1960s. Open heart surgery, bypass surgery, uh, in vitro fertilization, that test tube baby, born in the 70s, one of a kind, such a miracle, that's normal course of medical science now, isn't it? You need a kidney? I can give you one. We are mapping our human genome. We are doing in utero surgery to correct defects on babies before they're born. We're working every day at a very fast pace to eradicate illnesses and diseases and we want make us live so with that we can live longer. And they say that the person that's going to live to be 150 has already been born. Think about what that means to middle age. 75 is the new 30. <laughs> means a whole lot different to your retirement planning. And, and we laugh and we go, 150, who's going to live to be 150? Well, 50 years ago, who was going to live to be 100 regularly? You know, put it in perspective. And it's because of medicine. So with the march of medicine like that, this becomes some place we don't have to go so often. We're not confronted with our mortality the way the colonials and the Victorians were, where it was a, just a normal everyday occurrence. It was part of life. They knew it was coming. They prepared. They talked about it. It was out in the open. We've cloistered that discussion. This is unpleasant. We don't want to go to wakes. We don't want to go to funerals. We don't want to admit that we're mortal. I ain't never going to die because I can have surgery when I'm 95 years old to give me a new heart, to open up my arteries, whatever the case may be. We, want to, we have the ability to cheat death on a very regular basis. So for a while, this space becomes, because we don't go there, it becomes someplace that loses its identity. We don't say who we are on the faces of the stones. We'll have a family name, we've got first names, we've got a beginning year, we've got an ending year, and we don't have a whole lot in between. We don't have a whole lot of art, we don't have a whole lot of personality. This becomes some place I can't meet anybody when I walk through the gate, the way I can when I go to a colonial burial ground, or I go to some place like Pine Hill or Pleasance Hill, and meet the people, not just the individuals, but families and see what society was thinking and doing at a particular point in that time period. Well, the good news is, in the last 30 years or so, with technology, we have decided that we, we still don't want to talk about our mortality, don't get me wrong, but we do want to talk about who we were when we're not here any longer. Or our families want to talk about who we were when we're no longer here. So we've decided to put some personality back on the faces of those stones. So this is the part in the next slide or two where you might see somebody you know. Because they, like I said, came to town, I took pictures, and some of them are going to show up here. So we want to, we want to talk about ourselves. We want to say who we were. We put pictures on stones. This is called a photo ceramic. This is an etching. It can be done by laser or it can be done by incredibly talented and immensely patient people that etch every line of that image into the stone. And it's not uncommon 
to put pictures on stones. We had just kind of gotten away from it. Now it's making a, a resurgence. If you go into a garden cemetery and you see a, a stone tablet, a marble tablet that has a little square in it, maybe two by two or two by three at the top of the stone, you had a photograph in there. Photography was invented in 1839 and it becomes something that is mass available by the 1850s and forward. So it's not unusual to put pictures on stones. We, so we wanted to say who we were, what we look like. I can put faces. I can see this person now. Somebody that I existed contemporaneously with but never had an opportunity to meet because of that crazy space-time continuum thing. Can't be in all places at once. We also want to say what we did for occupations, who we were. I was a firefighter. I was a truck driver. I worked in Engine House 4. I get something now that I couldn't get for a, for a slice of time before that. And not only did we want to say who we were, we wanted to say the things that we enjoyed. What did we do with ourselves with the time that we were given while we were here? Well, we loved our doggies. This is where we lived. And I mean, that's some, that was done from a photograph, uh, whether it was done by laser or done by hand on the stone. That's a lot of detail. I got a bulkhead here. I've got, here's my front, my bushes out front. I lived in my home. I loved my home. I enjoyed my home. I loved riding. And who doesn't love riding? All week, it's going to be good. Get out there on your bikes, motor powered or pedal powered. We liked to go on road trips. We liked to ride and have the wind in our faces and enjoy the scenery. We had boats. We loved the ocean. We loved the lighthouses. We loved spending our time by the sea. I can't tell you how many stones I see with lighthouses on them. Most popular one, Nubble. I see Nubble continuously. So we want to say who we enjoyed and uh, who we were and the things that we enjoyed, the things that made us individuals and members of modern society. And as members of modern society, we have technology. I can hear you snickering already. So as modern people, we've got technology. We know it's an integral part of our lives. We, we can't exist without it. This is video. So what you're looking at attached to the stone is a video box. It's about seven inches in diameter. What you're looking at here, this is the screen and this is the door. So that door closes over the screen. It protects it from the weather. The unit is solar powered and it runs three days on a full charge and it runs an hour of still video. Really? Still video? How archaic is that exactly? You guys familiar with this? It's a QR code. QR stands for quick response. It's a UPC code. So it's exactly like the UPC codes we're used to seeing with all of the lines. It's just a variant of it. And what it is, it's for people that are too lazy to pick up their phones and type www.gravestonegirls.com or whatever website you choose to enter. So this guy has been making, this QR has been making a resurgence in the last couple of years. And I see it in a lot of places. Um, you'll see it on coupons. You'll see it on other types of advertising. Um, a lot of times you'll see it if you go to a historic venue that has signage. And if you want more information, you use the QR code. So here, this QR code, this has been enlarged for your viewing pleasure. It's right here. It's called the memory medallion. It's about an inch in diameter. It's metal. It's created by the memory medallion company. They're located in Pennsylvania. They hold the U.S. patent to use QR technology for memorialization. And when you purchase one from memory medallion, they put your own little QR code on it. You get it installed on your gravestone. And then somebody like, oh, I don't know, a nosy gravestone girl comes along with her smartphone and a QR reader app on it and 
Let's see if we can do this. I'm going to stand right in front of you. I'm just going to sit right on your lap. How's that? Come on, come on, technology. We use that app to scan that QR code, and it's going to take me to that person's website. If you've got a QR reader on your phone, you can do that from here, because I just did it live. This person's website, provided by a memory medallion, has 999 spaces. You can do anything you want with it. You want to put your pictures out there. You want to put your achievements. You want to put your writings. You want to put your cat videos, your cat pictures, because there's not enough cats on the internet. <laughs> anything you want. It's your website to do anything you want with. You want to say who you were. You want to say the things that you did. Well, when you scan this QR code from Memory Medallion that they use, it brings you to their spokesmodel. And her name is Sarah Buchanan. And once we thumb through Sarah Buchanan's website of all her regular stuff, we'll find something of extra interest, I think. A 16-minute video of her making the Secret Family Fudge recipe. So apparently she was queen of the Secret Family Fudge recipe in life. And she wished to retain that title in death. So there's a 16-minute video out here of her bossing her adult son around the kitchen <laughs> while they together make the secret family fudge recipe. Not so secret anymore. I know this sounds crazy. Every time I put this slide up in New England, everybody goes, We just can't get it. And I will tell you that I have not seen this on the landscape. I've heard there's one. I might get verification tonight. I've heard there's one around, but um, I've yet to see one. And I think one of the reasons is we are just way too puritanical. We are still just as puritanical now as we were 400 years ago. And this is, this is just out there for us conservative New Englanders. I will tell you, you get outside of New England, you will find this in other places. You'll find it in the Midwest. You'll find it in the South. You'll find it on the West Coast. Uh, the funeral directors, the monument dealers, they are offering this to us because we're the modern people. We understand video. What happens when you leave the house without this thing? Don't you turn around and go back and, oh, my God, what am I going to do all day without this? They, they know that we understand the technology and we can choose to embrace it to show who we were and what we wanted to say about ourselves. There's a few others I wanted to make sure that you knew about that I found while I was out wandering around. Remember those with the marble? There was two other pictures I wanted you to keep in mind as an object. So these guys, and I found a number of them, um, in Pleasant Hill, including a family plot with a, a master and then a number of headstones uh, included. So these are called white bronze. They're made by the Monumental Bronze Company in Bridgeport, Connecticut. They were created from the last quarter of the 1800s into the early 19 teens. They are neither white nor are they bronze. It's brilliant marketing, if you ask me. So the Monumental Bronze Company made bronze objects. And at the time, last quarter of the 1800s, bronze is an up-and-coming material. So it's being used in the land of the living. It's also being used in the land of the dead in the cemetery. So we have bronze doors. We have bronze vases or vases because bronze is expensive. Um, we have bronze plaques. We have bronze statuary. But you've got to have the money to have something modern and fancy like that in your cemetery. So the Monumental Bronze Company says, well, we're making this high-end stuff. We're also going to want to reach out to that second tier. We want to reach out to that other consumer that doesn't have as much money to spend but wants something new, fancy, interesting. So how are we going to market this? Well, we're going to market it with this great title, like I said, White Bronze. Neither white nor bronze. They're this pale blue, blue gray, and they are zinc. 99% pure zinc, smelted at the foundry, poured into molds, and then the molded piece is assembled to be the monuments you see on the landscape. 
They called it white bronze because everybody understood the word bronze. Everyone was familiar with it. Bronze had a special cachet. I'm expensive, I'm fancy, I have money. But what happens when you put bronze outside? It oxidizes very rapidly and it goes from being that beautiful bronze color to being green and black and streaky and without maintenance, it very quickly becomes far less attractive on the landscape. So they capitalized by, in making this, Monumental Bronze Company capitalized on the idea of bronze and by calling it white bronze rather than zinc belies the idea that these are not going to discolor on the landscape. So they cost less, they were new, and they were something different. They were still expensive comparatively, less than bronze, but you still needed some money to get them, uh, depending on shapes and sizes, of course. And you could have something new on the landscape that was never going to need to be maintained. These were not sold in stores. They were not sold by the Sears catalog. They were sold by traveling salesmen with design books. So the salesmen would come. These guys were usually, this was their second job. They're moonlighting. They think they're going to make all of this money off of these newfangled monuments. They've got a design book, so you pick whatever design you want. They've got the molds for them, they cast the molds, and they make you your special customized piece. If you go to town and you, have, uh, you find a lot of them in town, you had a successful salesman. You go to town, you don't find so many. Not so good of a salesman if you had a salesman at all. These were made up through the 19-teens. They start to fall by the wayside and get discontinued with the First World War because the factory space and the raw material of the zinc is needed for the war effort. When you see these on the landscape, now that you know what they look like, you will be able to pick them out no problem anytime you go anywhere. When you encounter one of them for the first time, go up and knock on it. If somebody answers back, run. But so far that hasn't happened to me. But it's going to return a metallic hollow sound because it is metal, it's zinc, and it's, it is hollow. It's all these pieces put together to make the structure. There is no internal armature to it. This is something on the landscape I wanted you to be aware of. This is over at Pine Hill. This is called the community mausoleum. So these are niches that you can buy to put cremains in. What's left after you cremate a body is called cremains. You put the vessel inside these niches. It is something new that uh, particularly older but also new cemeteries are doing as well as a way to continue to be able to offer interment space. You know, once you sell a certain number of plots, burial plots in the ground, that's all you got. So the, the burial grounds, the, the cemeteries need to come up with ideas to keep money coming in because they, they have to mow the lawn, they want to expand, they want to keep the place nice. So keep an eye out for those. Uh, they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Uh, they can be made like gardens, like this, uh, and you'll start to see them. I've seen them crop up a lot uh, in cemeteries recently. This is my office. I love my job. My job this evening has been to show you, to guide you, to teach you that cemeteries are fun places. They're educational. They are places to do that whole memento mori thing. They are the places to go commune with nature, go watch the birds, go take a walk, go read a book, go look at the art, go learn how to make the secret family fudge recipe. But they're living history museums. The Colonials are the first graphic art of the New World. They're art museums, and they're absolutely free.